Nobody had to die, man. Nobody. Especially a 10 year old kid. 10 year old kid. Hadn't even got his life started. Every single one of us is somewhat fascinated by something. Even murderers and serial killers are thought to be among us. However, their lusts and obsessions are totally different from most of ours. The majority of serial killers don't have mental illnesses. Although they've got character disturbances, they're aware of what's wrong, but their pleasure is too compelling to stop. But Matthew Hoffman's obsession with leaves is bizarre and unique compared to other notorious murderers. Unfortunately, covering his house's floors and walls with leaves, killing squirrels, and eating them wasn't good enough. Therefore, after a bloodbath, he hid the three bodies, in a hollowed-out tree, along with their dog, which he also stabbed to death. The Beast of Ohio grew up in the Warren area, before moving to Knox County, when his parents split up. But the kid was always unhappy and acting strangely. His strange behavior was due to his difficult childhood, with his parents constantly fighting and his father being an alcoholic. This caused him to feel isolated and misunderstood, and he developed a deep resentment towards society. Some people thought he was weird, but no one believed he was dangerous. While others watched in disbelief, he ran underneath a giant moving tractor. He was like a dog chasing a car, not sure what he would do if he ever caught it. And while it wasn't an indication of what he would do in life, he had an odd fascination with trees. He would often be seen walking in the woods, talking to the trees, like they were his friends. While his behavior seemed strange, it was seen as harmless, since he never showed any signs of aggression or violence. People assumed that he just had a love of nature, and was content to spend time in the woods with his friends. But one day, he and a friend got in trouble with the police, when they were found on the roof, of Lakeview High School. This incident seemed to be a one-time event, as Hoffman had not previously been involved in any illegal activities, and had been seen as a harmless nature enthusiast. The police recognized Hoffman as someone who had no intention of causing harm, and let him off with a warning. After moving to Apple Valley. During his time at East Knox High School, Hoffman studied industrial electricity at the Career Center. The program allowed Hoffman to get hands-on experience with different types of electrical systems, and an understanding of the safety protocols necessary to work in the field. With his newfound knowledge, he was able to secure a job with a plumbing contractor in Colorado, and he was able to hit the ground running. While his boss had some good words to say about the shy but hard-working kid, a few months after his 21st birthday, Matthew completely screwed up. He was sent to do some plumbing in a businessman's house, and he heard that he was leaving town for a few weeks. So the next day, he returned to that same house, broke in, stole whatever he stole, and set it on fire to cover up the crime. To make sure no evidence was left behind, he recklessly started a fire, causing extensive damage to innocent people and their property. Ten gallons of gasoline were sprinkled, and the fire spread to adjoining units, sending 16 people running from their condos. The man's actions were not only criminal, but also reckless and dangerous. He not only put the lives of people in adjacent units at risk, but he also caused $2 million in damage. Luckily, no one was killed or seriously injured. He then went home to Knox County, where his mother and stepfather lived. Nevertheless, Steamboat Springs police suspected, he also stole welcome to the city signs, and he agreed to go back to Colorado to resolve the issue. And that's, when and where, he was arrested and sentenced to eight years in prison. He only served six years, and after his parole, he returned to Ohio, where he reported to local parole authorities. By making regular payments, he was able to show that he was taking responsibility for his crime. And by the time, he was released from parole, he had paid about $4,800 of the $2 million in restitution he owed for the arson. Despite his best efforts, the amount he was able to pay was a fraction of what he owed, 
forcing him to take extreme measures. So, he started trapping and eating squirrels. At the time, he was also working as a professional tree trimmer, leading to a strange obsession with trees. A few days before his 38th birthday, things weren't going well in his life. He broke up with his girlfriend, after she accused him of choking her during an argument. Even his dog ran away. But the split had left him feeling hopeless and alone, and he was desperate to prove to his girlfriend that he was capable of being a better partner. In fact, his financial situation was so bad, that he couldn't even throw himself, a proper birthday party. It was like trying to fill an empty bucket with a hole in the bottom. No matter how hard he worked, it felt like he was just taking one step forward, only to be thrown two steps back. Several days later, he lost his part-time tree trimming job, because he creeped out his supervisor. Hoffman's situation was bleak, no matter what he did, it seemed like he was running in circles, never making any progress. He had tried various jobs, from tree trimming to truck driving, and even had to rely on his mother for help. The situation was incredibly difficult, and it seemed like there was no light at the end of the tunnel. At the time, he stayed with his mom in Apple Valley, about a third of a mile, from where, the two children, and two women disappeared. He parked his car and walked to the house of Issa Herman, and her two children from her first and only marriage. He decided to steal some valuables, and started stalking the house for a few nights. He got to the woods, across the street from the house, a little after midnight. That night, he slept across the street in a sleeping bag. When he woke up in daylight, there had been two cars parked at the house all night, but the grey car had left. He fell back asleep until around nine in the morning, when a woman left in a pickup truck. There were no cars at the house, so he walked across the street and tried to get in, but the door was locked. After that, he went in through the garage door, which wasn't closed all the way, so he slid under it. He then kicked the garage door open, and entered the house. Taking a closer look, he made sure no one was there. Even though he did not take anything, being in someone else's home without them there, was exciting to him. He also felt a sense of power over the house, and its occupants, knowing that he could enter without them knowing. He was looking for anything of value that could be easily carried. But he did not find anything of real value. After being there for about an hour, he was getting ready to leave, but someone pulled into the driveway. He was back in the bedroom, when the woman entered the house, and was unable to exit without breaking a window. So he decided to use the knife to make it easier to escape in a hurry, in case he got into trouble. He knew that if he was discovered, he would not be able to make a dignified exit, and the knife was his only chance to get away without harm. So, when Lisa made her way back into the bedroom, he confronted her, and made her get on the bed, lying face down. He also had a blackjack, so he thought of knocking her out. He hit her a couple of times in the head, but it did not knock her out. He then tried to choke her, but she was still fighting back. He was desperate and panicked, so he resorted to violence to try to subdue her. However, it didn't work, and his situation escalated further, when a family friend, Stephanie Sprang, showed up unexpectedly. He had no idea how, or when she got there, and what she was doing in the house. In his desperation, he tried to use physical force to restrain Stephanie and keep her quiet, but it did not work, and he was unable to control the situation. The presence of another person had made the stakes even higher, and he was now in a state of confusion. He grabbed the knife that he had put down on the nightstand and stabbed Lisa on the bed, through her back, twice. He then chased Stephanie into another room, and stabbed her a couple of times in the chest. He then went back to the other bedroom, where Lisa was located, and stabbed her a couple more times. With terrifying and calculated ease, he had taken the lives of two women in a matter of minutes. As he wandered around the house slowly, he felt immense guilt, knowing that he had made a mistake that could change his life forever. During this time, he also killed the dog, because it would not stop barking. After a while, he felt he had no choice, but to cover up his mistake by disposing of the bodies, and burning the house down. 
At first, he thought about loading the bodies into the vehicle, driving it into Foundation Park Pond, and then swimming away as the vehicle sank. But he was aware that the water in the pond was cold, and he was concerned that if he got into the water, he wouldn't be able to make it out alive. He was also aware that if he was seen driving the vehicle into the pond, it would draw attention, and potentially make it easier for police to trace the crime back to him. He felt that by disposing of the bodies inside a tree, it would be much harder for anyone to find them. And so he began the gruesome task, with determination and purpose. In the bathroom, he began processing the bodies, working meticulously and tirelessly, knowing failure would be catastrophic. The bodies were cut and processed, until they were unrecognizable. Then he used garbage bags, and placed the bodies inside. Once he had finished processing the bodies, he moved the jeep into the garage, and loaded them up. He still had a couple of bags to load up, when he heard two voices in the house. He quickly ran to the back door to stop them, but it was too late. They had already seen what he was doing, and were screaming in terror. When he confronted them, Sarah ran into a bedroom. Despite Cody's efforts to hide, he followed him, and ruthlessly attacked the helpless boy, showing no mercy. Being a coward, he stabbed Cody, in the chest, a couple times. Unflinchingly, he walked out of the room, leaving him, lying in a pool of blood. He then ran into the bedroom after Sarah, to make sure she was not on the phone for help. She wasn't, and he couldn't bring himself to kill her. But he gagged her, in the back of Stephanie's jeep, next to the trash bags, containing her mother's remains. Hoffman drove the jeep to his own car, a Toyota Yaris parked a mile from the family's home, and transferred Sarah into that car. He then drove back to his own home, and locked her in a bathroom, while he hid the bodies of her family. He took them out to a remote place in the woods, where he climbed a large, hollow tree, with an opening about 35 feet up in the air. He used this hole to dump the bodies into this hollow tree, where they would never be found, unless he told law enforcement. After returning to his 109-year-old home, Hoffman tied her hands, and feet, with duct tape, and forced her to sleep on leaves, in the damp basement of his home. He also let her play video games, and they both watched the two Iron Man movies together. He even cooked hamburgers for her, and slept with his arm around her. After a day of bloodthirsty murder, he decided to nap. While he slept, he tied Sarah to himself so she wouldn't escape. To his surprise, he found himself asleep, soundly and peacefully, next to the little girl, as if he hadn't just killed her mother and brother, just hours earlier. Sarah looked around the house in horror. She had never seen anything like it before, and it was clear that he had been stockpiling leaves for some time. The room was covered in leaves, dark, cold, and wet. Despite her best efforts to make conversation, Hoffman was unresponsive. He seemed to be in his own world, not giving any indication of what his plans were, for the little girl. Lisa Herman was reported missing the next day when she did not show up for work at a local Dairy Queen. When the police searched the house, they found blood spots on the floor, and Stephanie's car in the driveway, which could be signs of a struggle. Hoffman awoke, went back to the Herman's house, stole the family truck, and planned to use it to retrieve gas cans, that he would use, to burn the house down. He just kept reaching for the wrong answer, and getting himself deeper into trouble. The truck, however, stalled out, so Hoffman had to abandon it, and use his car. Police suspicions were first aroused when they found him sitting in his own car, beside the abandoned Herman family truck. Almost immediately, a deputy pulled up and asked for his ID, and why he was there. At that point, Hoffman returned to his home, where he built a campfire outside his house, drank a bottle of wine, and burned his shoes. For three days, Sarah was terrified, as she realized that Hoffman was mentally unstable, and she was losing her life. As Sarah felt further and further away from her family, she felt increasingly powerless and helpless, against the whims of Hoffman. He had complete control over her, and used his power to take advantage of her. 
in the most horrific way possible. He fed his demons, and scared and alone, had no choice but to submit to unspeakable horror. This abuse was a complete violation of her autonomy, stripping her of her dignity and humanity. To make matters worse, he would torment her with verbal abuse, no matter how much she begged to clean herself. Only after a couple days, he took a white plastic bag, with holes cut out for her legs, and used it like a makeshift diaper. And as dumb as a box of rocks. Police found a Walmart bag containing a tarp and trash bags, that the killer left behind in Herman's home. The barcode on the items, allowed investigators to trace them back to the store where it was bought, and the time of the transaction. From there, they were able to use the store's surveillance video, to identify the individual who made the purchase, and his Toyota Yaris. His name was then confirmed as a match, after investigators ran a database search, to compare Yaris vehicles in the area, to the one used in the purchase. His connection to the crime was further confirmed, when the deputy said he had talked to him the day before, in the same area. With this evidence, Hoffman became the only suspect in the case. After obtaining a search warrant, authorities entered Hoffman's apartment, which was filled with leaves stuck to the walls with trash bags. When investigators broke down his door, they found the girl bound to a bed, made of tree leaves, in a corner of the dark basement. After being arrested, Matthew Hoffman still refused to give up the locations of the bodies of the other three people. In a 10-hour interview with two different police departments, he refused to talk about the bodies. No matter what, Matt, do the right thing. I'll, I'll beg you, man. It doesn't matter to me. I'll beg. Christ, I'll get down on the floor and beg you if that's what it's going to take. Just please, please tell me where. Please take me. I don't care. It has to be done. Obviously you don't. You say. Well, you know what? You, you want to play this little game? Act like a hard ass, okay? You don't want to tell us where Cody is, okay? You don't want to tell us where the girls are. Well, won't you tell us how you killed the dog? Right in front of Sarah. You killed him. What'd you do with him? Nah, you didn't do that. I don't believe you'd done that. Yeah, right in front of her. As she's tied up. Bound. Yeah. You're kidding me. What'd you do with the dog then? You didn't do that, did you, man? You don't give a shit about the families. That's fine. What about the dog? You know, if I'm not mistaken, I heard, and I didn't believe it either, but I heard that Matt might have, might have uh, done away with a couple puppies they had at one time. I didn't believe that. So, you know, sometimes puppies just don't live, but... Well, the same with squirrels. Yeah, but Matt likes them. Matt hunts. He likes yeah. squirrels. In his backyard and then eats them. Backyard. Yeah. I don't see anything wrong with eating squirrels. But you think... Or... But then I guess the puppy story must be true. A couple of them. Yeah. It just so happens to... Pass away. Who'd you kill the puppies in front of? You know, I guess I'm a little confused. You, you know, you tell people Sarah's your girlfriend, but yet you keep her tied up. You abuse her. You take her dog. And you torture and kill the dog right in front of Sarah. Days before that, you kill the family. Mm. Mm -mm. What, what kind of man are you? What kind of a man am I going to go tell your mom who's telling me all this good stuff about you? Couldn't believe that you would do something like that. Looks like you could not. Although, thanks, well, maybe. I mean, he did have porn on the computer at their house. That's why she booted you out.
I steal all the time, steal their tools. That's why they booted you out. Sure. Matt. I mean, I spent. Oh, it's 12 o'clock. All this time in here thinking you was a good guy and you was going to help me out. Matt, you destroyed many families. Many families. Like you're an animal. You destroyed them. And you know what? I got a family member coming into the lobby. They just called. Sarah's dad. He's going to get some good news, but he's going to get some real bad news too. This would be a good time, man. I'm going to go up front and say, you know what? I don't even have to say it took three hours for Matthew to man up. Say where the rest of them's at. But Matthew, don't think we'll ever find them, I think, maybe. I think maybe that's it. Yeah. We'll find them. I guarantee you that. Think we'll find them, Matthew? If this is just a game, you're going to lose. I'll tell you right now. You will lose. That bathroom was bad. Well, that was a bad, bad scene in the bathroom. You didn't get to see that. Well, I heard it's probably spent a lot of time in the bathroom. Spend extremely a lot of time in the bathroom. A lot of time in some vehicles. A lot of time in the living room. Uh, hallways, bathroom, master bedroom, Sarah's bedroom. Hmm. Sarah's bedroom wasn't. Didn't look like it. Sarah, the girlfriend? Yeah, I didn't know Sarah was a girlfriend. But she must have been. Now, maybe that's why his heart's broken. I don't know. Didn't have a heart. I don't know, he just said it was broken. I think Matt was uh, Matt was starting to starting to feel a little sad and feel a little sympathy for the family, empathy for the family. But then he took him a little nap there and must have reverted back to I don't know, another personality. Because obviously he's not really caring now. Everybody changes their feelings, I certainly have. Yeah, I can see that. Listen to a 13-year-old girl. Tell me what the heck he did, man. Hmm. You don't you don't care, do you? You don't give a shit, do you? Huh? You obviously you don't give a shit. He's got a heart. Honestly, think he does. And you know what? We, we might as well just uh, just go tell your mom that you just don't give a shit. You don't let her feel the way she wants to feel about you. If you're going to be like that, that's incredible. Listen to her and what she said so far, and she's just beginning. Yeah. You know? We're going to find them. You know we're going to find them. We're going to find them. Don't know what condition they're going to be in. We're going to find them. Some of them may not have earrings in and rings on. Are they? But we're going to find them. Don't forget about necklaces. And necklaces. Yep. People make mistakes sometimes, you know. People make mistakes. People only make mistakes when they want it to be a mistake. Matt, if you're hungry, I'll go get you a turkey sandwich. You eat turkey sandwiches? Matt likes turkey sandwiches. Don't you, Matt? The ones from Walmart? Matt, you think God's going to forgive you?
And I don't think the families will. I think they will if Matt helps out. I have to disagree with you on that one. What about God? Then God will? Yes. Between him and Matt. It's not up to me. I read him a couple articles out of the or yeah, articles out of the paper. And that's when I first for the beginning when you said he was tearing up, which I didn't really get, but I think Matt actually started to see what I was talking about this whole time about the family actually, you know, wanting wanting their family back. But I mean he looked me in the eyes a couple times, I suppose, the way Cody looked at him when, you know, last time he saw him. Probably the way Tina and Stephanie looked at him the last time they saw him. Sarah, when she's being abused and he's killing the dog in front of her. He couldn't have. He wouldn't have done that, would you, Matthew? Hmm? He wouldn't have done that. Matthew, everything's coming down. It's crushing. It's uh, all falling all around you. I don't know. I don't know if he was crying because he had remorse, or he's crying because he got caught. No, I think he's he's he actually feels bad about what he done. He actually does. He's just uh, he's not sure what he wants to say because he's number one. Matt, I figured out Matt when he wasn't here. Matt's a guy that likes to be in control. Uh, I think things went bad for Matt few days ago, worse than what he thought was going to happen. And then it snowballed. Just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And Matt was able to get back in control uh, of, of controlling, not control of himself, but he was able to get back into to controlling a situation. And we just actually talked about that before you come in. I talked about it. He listened, I think. But I explained to Matt that he was thought he was in control until this morning. And he may or may not have known that we was coming. Hmm. But I made him understand that spending three days in a crime scene would make a person know that, you know, hey, if you make one mistake, you're going to make many more mistakes. And Matt made a few mistakes. Matt made some mistakes that I'm sure he thought would never get him caught. But I think Matt was having a bad day on November the 10th, Wednesday. I think Matt was having an extremely bad day. Mm -hmm. And I think Matt knows that a couple times between Wednesday and today, he was very close to being uh, caught. I think that happened. Um, and then Matt got a rude awakening this morning. And he lost his control again. Then we come in here, obviously. And Matt's back at doing it again. So, I think Matt's got some control issues. He likes to be in charge. He wants to be in command. I'm beginning to think that you're right, that he might not care about people. Well, you know, right. I kind of look at it a little bit differently. I kind of look like this is a game to him. This whole thing's a game. Well, it has to be a guy that can sit there that long with his eyes closed yeah. and wishing we would go away. Maybe he's pouting because he realized, though. Yeah. It's like poker. He's out. He's got to fold. Thought he had a good hand by telling the deputy he was waiting for his girlfriend, Sarah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Watching the deputies go over to the to the truck. It's a game. Problem is, put all those chips in. He lost. He lost. A lot of people lost. Didn't they, Matt? You lost. He lost big. I think Matt can help him game though. 
far as I'm concerned, he lost. Game over, buddy. Even with the possibility of a life sentence looming over his head, Matthew Hoffman remained silent and did not give up the information that they sought. talk about it for a little while and you want to stop at any time, you can stop at any time if you feel like you're not sure. But it, I'd like to hear your point of view of the things that you do remember. Things that can help with Sarah. from everything we've talked about. Just looking at you, you're going to regret not not doing that. Because I, I think that's where the forgiveness comes from. Yeah. You're far from it. Things got out of hand. And we all do that. We all let our emotions bottle up. You're not alone in that. Even if it's the worst scenario, if 
he's gone, he can still have his body and have a proper burial. That means so much to families. I'm sure you can relate to that, or imagine that that would mean a lot. friend that was there has two, three children, a son, oldest son, a daughter in the middle, and a younger son that's nine. They want to know where their mom is, or at least give her a proper burial. That means everything to them. As kids growing up, they don't want to have the unknown going through their heads forever. It's better to know. It's called closure. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with any of that, just in general? Just the idea of it? Well, I agree that closure is good. I I can't give it to them. I, can't, I don't... I want to... I want to know what happened. But I'm afraid to know what happened. I've heard enough details to know that I don't, I don't know if I can handle it. Well, you won't have to handle it alone, which, which is probably what you've had to do in the past. You're not going to be alone. I'm wrong. I just sense in everything you've said that you do care about other people and their feelings. And sometimes we have to push through our own pain to get to the other side and help other people. And honestly, in the end, you end up helping yourself too because, like I said, I think you know it goes a long way in the court system when you are fully, you know, open about that and can help us find where they are, where Tina, Cody, and our friend are, all three of them. That goes a long way. But it's a choice you got to make to push through that pain. I'll sit right here. I'm not going anywhere. If that's what you want, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it for you. Because nobody should have to go through it by themselves. It's pretty scary. Well, as you said, I, I mean, that's, if you've heard enough to know that there's, that you were involved, obviously, pretty significantly, and I'm just afraid to really know. Again, that's something that you can give to others and be strong and in some way make up for some of what's already happened, some of the damage that's been done by doing that and giving that to them. I can guarantee you they're more concerned about that than you sitting here right now. I really want to go back to my cell. Okay. Sitting for too long. Actually, sit down. Let me let me grab some of those guys, Matt, and have them take you because I'm not sure exactly. Take the code. Okay. Just stand by here for a second, okay? Do you have any other questions for me? Do you want me to come back at any time? Okay. If you change your mind, I'm happy to do that. Okay, just, just know that if you ever want to talk to me again, I'm happy to do that. Okay, I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Do I come in?
Or you can stand if you're more comfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's good so it doesn't cinch down on you. Yeah, I think you probably Hey, Tom? Yeah. You call Jail and ask him to send somebody up to escort him back? Work out? No? You gotta do a little work out. I have a light one. They look a little tight to me. Okay? They hurt? Do you want to take some of this with you, your bread? Oh, we got a different key on these. I'll ask him uh, when she uh, when she comes down about this. Man. Sorry about that. I didn't even notice when you came. Well, I kept asking if you wanted to maybe loose them or take them off. Huh. Smells like food in here. <laughs> You guys probably oh. done a better job than we do. Yeah, there's usually some place you can put that and somebody will eat it. Mass, uh, just remember if you want to talk to me again, I come down, I don't mind at all. It's about anything. It doesn't have to be about anything serious. Whatever. A few days later, he told an investigator that he'd had a dream about being in a food processing plant. He said he opened a trash bag and saw cut up body parts, and he got a knot in his stomach. He then asked an investigator to allow him to write down the location and then shoot him in a fake escape attempt. When the police said they wouldn't agree to his terms, he kept quiet for two more days. This is when law enforcement negotiated a deal that took the death penalty off the table, and then he revealed the location. And in 2011, Matthew Hoffman pleaded guilty to 10 counts, and was sentenced to life without parole. Your Honor, please court on behalf of Mr. Hoffman, uh, we would at this time acknowledge the receipt of the indictment in this matter, waive any time requirements relative to service, waive a reading of the uh, indictment in open court, at this time, it is my understanding Mr. Hoffman is prepared to enter a plea of guilty to all counts. And Mr. Hoffman, do you understand everything that's been said here today? Yes. It's been indicated to me that you desire at this time to enter a guilty plea to counts one and counts two of the indictment, charges of aggravated murder and unclassified felony. Is that a correct statement? Yes. It's also been indicated to me that you desire to enter a guilty plea to count three, an additional charge of aggravated murder. Pardon me, of aggravated murder under a different statute, an unclassified felony. Is that a correct statement? Yes. It's also been indicated to me that you desire to enter a guilty plea to count four, a charge of ag aggravated burglary, a first degree felony. Is that a correct statement? Yes. You desire to enter a guilty plea to count five, a charge of kidnapping, a first degree felony. Correct? Yes. And is it your desire to enter a guilty plea to count six, a charge of rape, a first degree felony? And to count seven, a charge of tampering with evidence, a third degree felony. Yes. And you decided to enter a guilty plea to counts eight, nine, and ten, charges of abuse of corpse, fifth degree felonies. Correct? Yes. Uh, is there any defendant would like to say on his own behalf or anything counsel for the defendant would like to put on the record before the court passes sentence? Your Honor, uh, Mr. Hoffman has asked me to make a brief statement. That is simply, the family deserves to know that this was a random burglary that went terribly, terribly wrong. No one person, no family was singled out. It's tragic. I can't undo what is done. I apologize. Thank you. 
Finding the pleas to be voluntary, the court accepts the pleas and finds the defendant guilty. One of the victims has uh, given me permission to read her statement for her, and uh, I can read my statement first. If there's no objections. <coughs> Your Honor, I'm reading a, a statement that uh, was uh, given to me and prepared by Sarah Maynard. It says, Sarah's typed letter. She writes, this has changed my whole life and my family's life too. My mom constantly worked, so I never got to see her, and I never really talked to my brother Cody. This is so sickening, Matthew, to know you even had the guts to do this to a family. Stephanie was a great woman too. She watched Cody and I whenever my mom needed her to. All I'm thinking about is how sick and disgusting Matthew is. I will never forget to this day about Cody and my mom, Tina. I think Matthew was really stupid for killing the dog, too. What could we have possibly done to you for us to get treated like this, Matthew? There is no reason why Matthew should have killed my family. I knew you killed my family, Matthew, when you kidnapped me. I kept asking you if you killed my mom and brother, and you said, don't worry about it. He will have to suffer the rest of his life like we had to suffer. How could you possibly do this to a loving and caring family? Matthew, you must have been planning this for a really long time because you have to have skills and time to do such a thing to someone like us. I know for a fact that he didn't do this by himself. I don't understand why Matthew is such a coward and can't tell us who else was involved in this. From what I know and heard Matthew tell us that I was talking to someone else. Also, Matthew, you had told me that someone dropped you off at our house because there was no other vehicles in our driveway besides my mom's truck and Stephanie's Jeep. I hope you didn't make up the letter, Matthew, because we were going to find out the information anyway. Matthew, I wonder if this stuff is even going through your head, saying to yourself, why did I even do this? Because now I'm in prison for life.